it's a stereotype and it's not an accurate one because in my experience i mean i've worked with every walk of life i've worked with public officials with doctors with every type of professional with building managers you you name it there are people in whatever walk of life who have a relationship to outdoor cats now there now that there are you know the old ladies who with their shopping carts who go around and feed a lot of them and god bless them but to characterize the universe of people who are bonded and care about these cats to one um stereotype is is just creating your own obstacle yeah. because yeah. you're not going to you're not going to reach people in a way that's effective if the goal is population control Welcome to the Call the Vet Show, the podcast that helps pet parents understand and optimize the health of their furry family so they can live the full and happy life you want for them. And here's your host, veterinarian Dr. Alex Avery. Hello, kia ora. Welcome back to the show. And I've got one for the cat lovers there, but also any animal lover, any wildlife lover, because today I'm talking to Brian Cortis about the problem of stray and feral cats, both the problem with their health and well-being and the welfare of the individual, as well as the colony of cats. But also we're diving into the conflict between cats and wildlife, what the actual true story is as well as some top practical tips that we can take on uh, from an institutional uh, government regional council level but also how us as individuals can be a part of this solution and then for those of you who aren't really cared about don't really care about wildlife or the health of these cats actually how the health of our pet cats can be affected by stray and feral cats and having them in your area which may just change your mind about why this is important. This really is a fascinating, wonderful conversation, uh, and I'm really excited to bring it to you today. But before we get into that, if you haven't listened to the podcast before, then I'm veterinarian Dr. Alex. I'm your host of the show, and I'd love for you to hit that subscribe or follow button on whichever app you're listening to this on. And for those of you that have been here for the journey for some time, then welcome back. I'm delighted to be sharing your ear drums with you again for another week. And with that out the way, here is my wonderful conversation with Brian Cortis. Here's this episode's expert interview. Brian, welcome along to the show. It's really great to be talking to you today. Well, thank you, Alex. I'm I'm happy to be here and appreciate the opportunity. So, um, Brian, I'm really interested in how you got into the 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 world of stray and feral cats because it's not an obvious avenue with your early life as an attorney. Have you always been a, a cat person? You know what what brought you into this field? Well, I've always had an affinity for cats. I always had pet cats when I was growing up, and and my own as an adult. But I really didn't have that much to do with uh, free roaming cats uh, until I was I was in my neighborhood walking by an empty lot one day, and then I came upon um, several kittens that were just running around in the grass, and uh, you know I felt like I needed to to respond to that in some way, and my first thought was I would uh, catch the kittens and give them to my rescuer friends, um, and that would take care of it. Unfortunately, it turned out as I researched uh, that that uh, location, there were 30 cats that were living in the inner courtyards. I was living on the Upper West Side of Manhattan at the time, so maybe not a place you would expect to see a lot of feral cats running around, but um, there were 30 of them. They, none of them were spayed or neutered or desexed, and um, it was just a situation that was out of control. I did I did what I like to say any good citizen would do, which was I tried to find somebody else to take care of the problem for me. Um, <laughs> but there was not there were no services available. Uh, this situation I came upon was repeated literally thousands of times throughout New York City. The shelters were overwhelmed. They didn't want feral cats. They didn't um, have services for veterinary treatment for them. So I was I was advised. Um, why don't you why don't you try to um desex them and then uh take care of them where they are and and that seemed like a kind of an odd notion to me at the time um but i tried to rescue and place a couple of them and then uh, one poor foster girl she she a college girl she um the cat 
destroyed her brand new couch, her couch, <laughs> and then by peeing all over it. And then we had to take her stove apart to because the cat was hiding behind it. And, and it became apparent these were not particularly adoptable uh, animals. So we went ahead, myself and a couple of neighbors, and, and we got them fixed, put them back, took care of them, found homes for the easily socializable kittens. And it turned out to be a very successful project. Um, population went from 30 to about 12 with the adoptions. Uh, the nuisance behavior that people were complaining about um, went away. And it was so successful that the next block over wanted us to do the same project because they had a colony of feral cats in their alleyways. So we did that. And then we worked in the park um, in that, that part of Manhattan. And then we ended up working throughout the neighborhood over the next couple of years, just as volunteers. By the time we got to animal control and started to seek some support for the work we were doing, they looked at their data and they saw that the number of cats coming in from the zip codes where we, the postal codes where we had been working was down over 70% um, compared to a slight rise in the rest of the city. So that got their attention. And then we started working with larger national organizations like the ASPCA and the Maine Society of the United States um, and teaching people how to do this work and how to do it safely. And it uh, just kept growing um as uh you know it, and it continues to this day you know we do some projects overseas we're um consulting on a research project in australia right now so it really was something that was very organic how i started and what it what i think happened was that this was a real problem in search of a solution and um, desexing the cats and maintaining them where they were was a solution that that really took hold um, in the states, and yeah. so that turned into a charity. And here I am today, still doing this work twenty years later. Well, that's wonderful. That little piece of serendipity that, that that first find, and it's you know, I guess maybe in search of the right solution and the search of the right person to implement that solution as well, because that's no no mean feat. Um, I guess you know, hearing that. It's very similar to one of my first cats, a little ginger kitten. My wife went for a run down the um, the local river path, and these yeah ginger kittens came crawling out. It had obviously been dumped in the box, but that and and they were all you know very tame and very rehomeable. But there is that difference, I guess, between uh, what we would call a stray cat and a and a feral cat. Um, yeah, would you like to kind of explain that in a little bit more detail? Yeah, absolutely. So I think. Um... The term feral has different meanings at different locations. So I know, I don't know in New Zealand, but I know in Australia, a, a feral cat is, is a cat that is living um, completely uh, sustaining itself without any human support. So there's no human based food source. They're, they're basically living off of predation. Yeah. Uh, whereas a stray cat would be a cat that does have a human based food source, you know, either eating out of the dumpster or somebody comes by and feeds them every day. Uh, in, in the states in the united states the meanings are slightly different we refer to feral um more as a behavioral term so a feral cat is a cat that's not socialized that um you can't pick them up you can't pet them they they might not even let you come near them so that they become unadoptable for behavior reasons uh whereas a stray cat is is a cat that um used to be in a home and now has found itself uh, on either lost or abandoned and living on the street. Sure, sure. So that that would be the the, the main difference. And um, obviously, with feral cats, uh, since they're not, they can't be rehomed. Um, you know, we're, we're they need a solution. And and traditionally, the solution uh, for decades before the work we st we started. Uh, doing was to euthanize them and that um that was the dominant approach you know for at least 30 or 40 years uh prior to maybe maybe it's really take you know uh, the sterilization of cats as a form of population control has really taken hold in the last 10 years in this country and I just, I just always point out that if if removing the cats from the environment and and killing them had 
been a, a viable solution, we, we wouldn't be doing the work we're doing today. <laughs> we yeah. wouldn't be faced with a huge cat overpopulation problem. And we can get into, if you like, you know, the reasons why one works and potentially the, another yeah, does. Yeah. I mean, my understanding of that or my thoughts are that you're, remo- you're creating this void. And so you're just going to have more cats move into that area and it's a self-perpetuating cycle. Whereas if you've got a, a desexed population, they kind of maintain a stable population that isn't growing exponentially is that kind of accurate yes that's that's one of the primary reasons why removing cats from an environment doesn't work because they're there for a reason you know they wouldn't be there if there wasn't sufficient resources food and shelter uh to support their their existence just like you know you wouldn't have any form of animal living in an environment if that environment couldn't support them so if you just take the animal out of the environment there's all these unused resources that are just waiting for another a cat to come along and start to repopulate that area. So that's that's one of the major dynamics behind it. But another one is that with cats, unlike wildlife, there's a there's usually a very strong human element involved, and there's a bond that's involved. And our experience is that the people who take care of the cats on a daily basis are just as bonded to them as anyone would be to their traditional pet cat. They they have names for them. They bring them toys. They um, they're out there uh, taking care of them, whatever the weather is. There there's a very powerful bond. And if you try to implement a management approach that doesn't align with what um, the people who care for the cats want you're just going to get met with a wall of resistance. And um, so to to desex a colony of cats successfully to trap them, you have to know when, how many are there, where do they eat, when do they eat. Uh, you need to be able to withhold food at a certain time so that they're hungry. None of this will happen without the cooperation of the people who are caring for them. So if you announce like, well, we're going to come and help you by trapping all your cats and then killing them, that that's not going to elicit a cooperative response. On the other hand, if you come in and you say, you know, we'll remove cats, but only with your consent, if we think they're adoptable, um, otherwise we will return them and you won't be dealing with uh, kittens every every six months. That usually does elicit a cooperative response. So between the vacuum that, effect and, and the need to work with caretakers, the desexing is a more successful yeah. strategy in our experience. Yeah. I was wondering if you found that the once they've been desexed and then released back into their environment, that they uh, are healthier because I'm thinking of the drive to fight and mate and all that kind of thing is and the diseases that are associated with that. Do you find that in your colonies that are full now of desexed cats that they're actually healthier individuals as well? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Um I mean, first with the with the female cats, as you would know um, better than I, you know, once once they're desexed, uh, they're not subject uh, nearly as much to mammary tumors, for example, um, or uh, pyometra, which would be an, an infected uterus. So for the female cats, um, that that risk goes away. For the male cats, it's a lot about not fighting, and so they're not getting these these deep wounds. Um, and there are certain diseases that are passed, uh, like the feline immunodeficiency virus is mostly passed by uh, male cats fighting and, and deep bite wounds. Um, they pass the virus in that way. You also obviously have you know far fewer or no kittens, and they're the ones with the highest mortality rates. So you do end up with a much healthier cat population. Yeah. And I think that does have then a knock on effect to the pet cats as well. I mean, maybe in the States where, as I understand it, there's a lot more indoor cats, but, you know, here, a lot of the trouble that our cats get into are because of, because of fights and the diseases that get spread and meeting with the, the feral cats and the wild cats. And also just stresses to things like um, urinary tract disease in our pet cats, which can be caused by the stress of a, a, a new cat coming into their territory. So all of those kinds of things are going to have a knock on effect mm. for the wider pet, uh, owned cat population as well yes yeah absolutely and and something we often observe behaviorally is that um once the cats are desexed they a lot of them kind of mellow out 
and they start to become uh, more, you know, within a year or so, they become more social and there becomes more of a possibility of placing them in a traditional home, you know, if, if that's a desired outcome. Yeah, that's wonderful. Um, thinking of that human animal bond and actually um, one of the previous podcasts I've spoken, we spoke at length at, at, at that, which was fantastic to hear, but there's also this bond with the wildlife in an area. So, you know, nature enthusiasts, it's a big issue here where I am in New Zealand with the mm-hmm. native birds and the impact of cats going outdoors, killing the native birds who haven't grown up and evolved with the risk of predation is that conflict uh, uh, a real conflict what's the size of that conflict um and and is that a real concern and something that this also addresses that's a big question i know oh yeah no i mean the 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 wildlife issue is a big one you know that i'm i'm located right now in hawaii which um you know similar to new zealand is is home to a lot of uh, rare and and threatened endangered uh, species and a lot of a lot of them are birds and there is the potential for cat predation so it's a it's a heightened issue here in a lot of the states the cats are located in more urban centers or suburban um and uh it becomes an issue when when the cats are in critical habitat uh, for for threatened species uh, my understanding is in New Zealand, the species are are, mu- are much more widespread, the ones that are critical. Yeah. So there's more potential on a nationwide level for kind of cat wildlife uh, conflict. And I think what's what's unfortunate is that the relationship between the conservation community and the animal welfare community that that I represent, it's it's been framed as a conflict as a cat's. Uh, versus wildlife, cats versus birds. And uh, there's a lot of focus on all the um, real or imagined, uh, some of both, of the ills that that cats, especially feral cats, um, bring when it comes to to native wildlife. Um, And as a result, there's there's this conclusion that the cats need to be eliminated from the from the environment, that they shouldn't be there. And the problem with that, so I, 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 I'm not a scientist and I don't, I try to get into like, do the cats, you know, spread toxoplasmosis um, to the monk seals in Hawaii, for example, which they've been accused of. Um, or, you know, I, I'm not going to debate the value of an endangered uh, bird versus sure. a cat. Yeah. You know, sure. I think that's, that's a value choice. Um, my focus is on the we're, those of us in the animal welfare community. We want fewer cats that are unowned and and free roaming and not desexed uh, as a, a welfare issue or the betterment of of the animals as well as our communities. Um, the conservationists don't want the cats around to protect wildlife. In the end, we have the same goal right we're trying to have fewer cats when i first got involved i didn't think it was a good thing for 30 cats to be living and reproducing in the in a courtyard so i took steps to address that and if we focus on how do we get to that common goal how do we accomplish fewer cats that to me is a much more productive discussion than um saying you know cats shouldn't be there yeah. So that that doesn't that's just a statement of a problem. It's not a solution. So when I've worked with conservationists who who are able to bridge the values gap, because there is a gap. So animal welfare people tend to focus on the value of the individual animal and the life that is represented there. Conservationists tend to look at the group of animals and not so much concern about any individual but it's the survival of the species that is the value so that can bring you into conflict right if you have an individual whose life you um value and it's potentially harming the existence of the group but if you can bridge that gap and start to look at specific situations um so for an example uh, I was involved in a situation where there were 
was a group of feral cats living in the middle of a bird sanctuary. And, and um, a lot of these birds were, were on the critical list. So not a good thing, right? Yeah. Um, the solution when looking at that situation was the community was a peninsula and the bird sanctuary was at the lower part of it. So the solution ended up being to put a line in the peninsula and everything south of that line was a cat-free zone. So if a cat stepped into that zone, they were trapped and they were moved out of it and they were really located north of that zone. And if they were repeat clients, they would be really located off of the peninsula. So we ended up with no cats getting killed and the bird sanctuary not having that threat. Every situation is going to have a different set of circumstances and a different solution. And sometimes the solution is going to be to sterilize the cats, even though there's critical species nearby, because it's impractical to remove them all. So if we're talking about like a large public open space, um, uh, I'm thinking of a park in San, near San Francisco where there was a trail along the water, along the bay, and hundreds if not thousands of people used it on a daily basis. So there was constant abandonment of, of new cats. Um, and there was uh, also a critical, critically endangered uh, ground nesting bird. But to have swooped in and try to remove a couple of hundred cats and then change the environment so that no more could be uh, abandoned there and thrive there was really kind of not a possible, not a feasible solution. So what was done was the cats were desexed, the adoptable ones were removed, their feeding was situated as far from the nesting areas as possible. And over the next several years, the cat population significantly declined and the bird population rebounded. So there's no one size fits all. And we need to, as we need to get past this this black or white thing like that there should be no cats at all right that's very black or white or cats should be allowed absolutely everywhere without any limitation that's black or white and the solutions lie in the gray area and getting past the rhetoric and getting past the vilification of the different animals yeah i love that and that, that yeah that those different nuances are so yeah so important and and the different working with all the different stakeholders as well because yeah the moment you alienate one group you end up in a shouting match and and you never really get anywhere so i think that's the case with a lot of a lot of life is trying to find this this common ground and i guess the history of you know the the historic capture and euthanasia killing of the cat population failing to control that situation shows that that's really something that is incredibly difficult because cats they they breed incredibly well. I say if there's one thing cats do well, they it, it's it's to have kittens, um, and there's always going to be pet pet parents who don't get their cat desexed. So no matter how well you control that population, that's it, it's just not not viable. Are there other ways that kind of our, our maybe local um, lawmakers, town officials, and things can implement changes and changes in public policy that will make this all, all of this decision making and implementation easier? Yeah, I think the number one thing that public officials can do is um, to provide resources for desexing. Uh, you know, I know um, in in Australia, one of the key barriers to people uh, getting the cats to sex that they don't necessarily own, but are feeding on a daily basis and uh, and and really have a lot of characteristics of a pet, uh, is the affordability of getting them desexed. And in the research project that we're working with, with the um, Australia Pet Welfare Foundation in Queensland, they're providing significant subsidies to either make the desexing free or very low cost. And that has really resonated. And again, it's, it's, it's identifying the obstacles. Um, it's, it's number one, it's, um, to to accept that to have programs to desex the cats to make that possible you have to first get past that notion of like well they shouldn't be there right because that just ends up 
being a bottleneck that, that nothing yeah. gets through that so while they shouldn't be there they are <laughs> and they're reproducing rapidly so once you get through that and then you realize like hey you know it, it's like when i first did uh the, the sterilization of the cats in my very first colony i didn't necessarily think this was such a great idea i mean it was the upper west side of manhattan there's a lot of traffic i was still of the notion that all the cats should be in homes i i was skeptical yeah but it was better than doing nothing and it turned out and it's not always going to be a great success but it turned out to be quite successful so if you accept that desexing is a viable strategy, then you need to identify the reasons why people are not doing it. Um, is it because if they bring in a cat they don't own and 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 they say they're going to feed that, that they're feeding them that they're subject to some type of criminal penalty? Is it the cost? Is it the lack of knowledge of how to handle these cats in a veterinary setting? Because especially the feral ones, um, there's some without basic knowledge it's very challenging you know when we first started bringing trapped cats to veterinarians and they didn't know anything about feral cats we had a, a lot of cats that ended up in the ceilings of veterinary <laughs> offices because yeah, um, yeah. they would try to transfer them into cages and they would escape so we've developed techniques where they never leave the trap unless they're sedated so th there are basic ways but you have you have to teach people that so you know at finding the barriers why aren't people getting the cats de sex now and then as public policy um overcoming those barriers is is going to make a huge uh, a huge difference and also um removing the the uh the kind of negative image um of the stigma uh that often comes uh from uh, you know authorities when they're not really understanding the advantages of desexing um so people who are feeding the cats are are, are can be villainized um and that all discourages people from coming forward and having them do the right thing sure so sure. you know we we call it you know we tell people we, we want you to be a feeder, but we don't want you to be a breeder, <laughs> right? So, but if you try to shut down the feeding and you drive them underground, they're never going to work with you. Yeah, I think it's recognizing where those people are coming from, because I guess in society, there's the the stigmatization of the crazy cat lady or, you know, the person who who goes out and yeah has got the neighborhood of cats and, and they're not maybe respected and they're thought to be a little bit crazy, but, you know, that often couldn't be further from the case they're they're very caring individuals who are really wanting the best for these animals and thinking of them as individuals like you say rather than as a a population group where the individual the individual doesn't matter and and it's a stereotype yeah and it's not an accurate one because um in my experience uh, i mean i've worked with every walk of life i've worked with public officials with doctors with every type of professional um with building managers um, you you name it there are people in whatever walk of life who have a relationship to outdoor cats now there now the, there are you know the old ladies who with their shopping carts who go around and feed a lot of them and god bless them but to characterize the universe of people who are bonded and care about these cats to one um stereotype is is just creating your own obstacle yeah because yeah. you're not going to um you're not going to reach people in a way that's effective if the goal is population control yeah so for people for those people that could have recognized maybe that this there's this situation going on in their neighborhood and they uh, are inspired to take action how do how can we go about starting to to trap these cats because they can be you know our, our feral cats our wild cats can be pretty wily they're not stupid and and catching them isn't always as straightforward as you might think no and and one of, one of the silver linings that came out of the pandemic for us at neighborhood cats the organization that that i work with is we had to bring all of our educational trainings online so that turned out to be a great thing because now our trainings are available on an international basis and um once a month 
we partner with an organization called the Community Cats Podcast, and we offer a two and a half hour training session. Um, if people can't attend it live, they can then watch, they have like 10 days, a week to 10 days to watch the recording. And that's a certification. So you can show, you know, that you've, you've been trained and we go over the basics of how to trap cats from first, for example, a lot of people don't know you have to establish a feeding pattern. You don't, you don't just show up with a bunch of traps and spread them around the neighborhood. You train the cats to be at a certain place at a certain time. Um, you need to have the right equipment. You need those basic handling techniques for uh, using the trap as a cage so that they don't have to be transferred. So we go through all of that. If anybody is interested, they can go to neighborhoodcats.org and on the homepage, you'll see a schedule of uh, upcoming uh, workshops or you can go to communitycatspodcast.com and uh, they have a list of the workshops that they um, host for us. So that would be a great first step is to get that training and get that certification. And and then you're off and running. Then it's yeah. then a matter of getting, um, having the right equipment and then uh, working with a veterinarian who, who will, um, if you go to neighborhoodcats.org, again, we have materials for veterinarians on how to handle cats. Um, can always write to us, can always email me, um, you know, info at neighborhoodcats.org and we'll be happy to send educational materials in in australia if you contact the australia pet welfare found uh foundation they develop pages of protocols on how to do this work properly so the information is out there the, the good news is it's not rocket science you know a couple of hours of training and and you can do this safely yeah and then it's a bit of intentionality and a little bit of you know, hard work to follow through with that, but it's something that absolutely can be done. And I guess uh, reaching out to other organizations because there may be funding available too. I mean, I'm just thinking locally, we've got, you know, two or three different, um, cat, you know, cat rescue organizations. We've got the SPCA, there's the RSPCA um, back in the UK. There's all of these organizations where some funding may be available. And also the um, your local veterinarian, they may have a, um, you know, a discount or a scheme or know of people who they mm -hmm. work with as well to, to make it more affordable, um, you know, for, for these situations as well. Yeah. And, and, you know, trapping is not for everybody. Um, but you can support people who are, who are doing this. Uh, so if, for example, um, we recommend if you're dealing with a large number of cats that you give yourself a couple of days to trap them, don't, don't wait for the day before when it might rain or something like that. So you need a place to keep them. So if somebody will lend you their garage for a couple of days, that may be the difference between that project happening or not. Um, donating funds. Uh, and as you say, reaching out to the, uh, uh, you know, reach out to the SPCA of New Zealand or local cat organizations, buy them some equipment. Um, there's all, there's all sorts of ways uh, to help uh, calling up your your local council officials and um, saying, hey, we, we want a publicly funded desexing program for cats. Um, that could be a big help. So there's a, a lot of ways to get involved. That's wonderful, Brian. So this has been some fantastic information. I love this. I, I deal with quite a lot of, um, you know, stray and feral cats. And yeah, I've learned how to handle them through the school of hard knocks and your, your talk <laughs> of um, a few cats being on the ceiling. Uh, yeah, you sometimes misjudge them. And um, yeah, it can be a little bit exciting trying to get them back in their cage. Thankfully, um, yeah, that doesn't happen too regularly anymore. But that's, yeah, <laughs> wonderful. And, you know, as as animal lovers, we should all want the best for, for these animals. Uh, and this is one way that we can provide it. So neighborhood cats, though, all those resources that you've mentioned, I'll pop them in the show notes. Is there any other social platforms or any other um, places that you'd like to send people who want to learn more about you and the work that your organization is doing, Brian? Well, neighborhoodcats.org, that, that's definitely the best, uh, the best place to go. Um, we have a, a number of books that I authored that, that are available on the site in the resources section about um, the hands-on work. We have the Neighborhood Cats TNR Handbook, which is all about trapping and feeding and building shelters. And then um, for people who are more interested in the policy level, um, I authored a book called Community TNR Tactics and Tools. And that talks about, you know, kind of broad stroke programs and how to in get the public involved and how to um, strategically use your resources and understanding that wherever you are in the world, 
where there's a free roaming cat issue, there are probably more cats than you have resources for. <laughs> yeah. So you have to go about it. If you're going to make progress, you need to do it in a, in a strategic way. But if you do that, you know, you know you'll you'll have success. So uh, if you go to neighborhoodcats.org, you'll you'll find all these resources. Also, the, the Humane Society of the United States, um, humanepro.org, they have a lot of good good materials too about um, what we call community cats. Fantastic. Well, Brian, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for sharing your expertise and thank you so much for the work that you do. It really is um, so very important. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Alex. I, I appreciate the conversation and um, I think exciting times for New Zealand and, and, you know, hopefully progress will be made. Helping your pet live the happy, healthy life they deserve. So this problem with stray and feral cats, it's something that really is an all too regular occurrence or to regular problem in my world in the veterinary clinic you know i see so many problems with fights with our pet cats with the diseases that get spread as a result of that and just we get some really horrendous cases of disease especially in stray and feral kittens that get looked after by numerous different rescue organizations in our area uh, and and they really are just not healthy they are not happy um, and it really is very tragic not to mention the fact that that has also led to a resurgence in diseases like panleukopenia that is a disease actually which i didn't see in the first maybe 12 13 years of my career but now is making a resurgence as our cat population as a whole is increasing so this is a a really important topic um brian gave some really top tips and i'd encourage you as well to get involved if you have any degree of inkling that this is a problem an issue that affects you and your pet as well there's numerous ways it doesn't involve you being out there trapping just supporting various organizations and together we can all help to work towards a better future And while that's it from me for this week, I'd love it if you could share this episode with any of your animal loving friends or family who you feel will benefit and will appreciate hearing the message that Brian has to share. Remember too to hit that subscribe or follow button on whatever app you're listening to this on. And until the next episode, I'm veterinarian Dr. Alex. This is the Call the Vet show because they're family. That's it for this episode of the Call the Vet show. Be sure to visit callthevet.org to join the conversation, access the show notes, and discover our fantastic bonus content. We'll see you next time.